Just type in. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'll stop the share. Uh, my name is Steve McPhail. Um, we're up to, um, we're back for another prep hour. Today is May 20, um, 2020. And I uh, hope this all finds you well um, and in good health and managing in these difficult times of COVID-19. I hope you can hear me clearly. I'll just set up a few things here to begin with. Hello to Sama, uh, Elena, Sarah, lots of people I can see here. L just let me set a few things up on my channels, everyone. I've got multiple things open. So I can see hello to Yeka, Yadram, Reka, various people. Excellent. Greetings all. Someone asked, can we stream on Zoom? No, um, not for this one because we're multi-streaming. So stream through your page, everyone. All right, so um, yeah, just type in where you're located, everyone, and what time it, in, um, what time it is. It's 5 p.m. here in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, so just put in those details while I set everything up. I'll just do a few greetings. All right, and as I said before, I'm Steve McFowl. I'm the director of OET Online. If you want to know more about um, who we are and what we do, I'll mention some stuff at the end of the letter but I will just put in the email address if you want to visit our website um, and do a bit of study. Um, you've got a place that you can do that. All right, so I've just posted that there for you. Okay, well, I think we'll get started, everyone. But I'll just, we've got Sanjaya from Sri Lanka, Jovita from India. Uh, we have Miraband from London. It's in the morning there. It's around the middle of the day in Sri Lanka and India. Um, hello to Bangladesh. Hope you're well. Hello to Alina in Ireland. Um, great to see people also coming from Pakistan, Dubai, Philippines in the afternoon and Singapore as well. Um, and hello to everyone in India. So yes, wherever you're located, um, sit back, relax. We'll spend an hour together doing some preparation to keep you focused on this exam. <clears throat> now, today we're going to do reading part B, everyone. And remember, this comes from the OET Center website, their task three. So you can find that on the OET Center task. It's task three if you want to review after, but we're going to do it live today. We're going to look at the language and vocabulary. We're going to look at some ways to choose the right answer and look at ways of ruling out the incorrect answer. Now, remember in the last month, we've already done reading part C. Uh, four weeks ago, two weeks ago, we did listening part C. Today, reading part B. Okay. Let's move forward and I'm going to share my um, slides with you. All right. Okay, so let's get this set up and working. That should be clear for everyone. We'll make it a good size so you can see it on your device. Hopefully that's nice and clear for you. Okay. So let's break down what is part B. So part B is, um, it's workplace text, everyone. It's a really fantastic thing, I think, about the OET exam, that 
it replicates the workplace. I'm sure that's a big uh, reason why you've chosen to do the OET exam because it is so relevant to your workplace. And any study you do will have positive washback into your um, future careers in an English speaking environment. So no other exam does this um, and does it so well in my opinion. So the part B is reading and listening really workplace orientated texts. Uh, in part B, it may be a policy document, um, some sort of hospital guideline regarding procedures, uh, could be some sort of manual um, describing how a certain piece of equipment should be used. And it may also include internal communication such as emails or memos. So they're the type of documents that you will get. Um, there will, in terms of time, I would allow no more than 10 minutes for all six because six questions, because you're going to need time for your part C. So that equates to really about 90 seconds per question. So you are going to do these MCQs quicker than you do part C, but there are the texts are generally a little bit shorter and the multiple choices, the big difference between part B and part C, of course, is that part B has three multiple choice um, answer, um, answers or questions, whereas part C has four. So that's quite a big difference there. You've got a better chance in part B and you've got to work a little bit more quickly. Now, what, what sort of strategies should we be employing? Well, you've got to read the question carefully. And depending on the question, you might have to identify different things. You may need to understand the overall gist or main idea of a text. Um, you might need to identify the purpose. Now, when we talk about purpose, quite often it's why it was written or who the intended reader should be. Um, or whether it's some sort of update of information that relates to the purpose. Uh, and some questions require you to understand the specific piece of detail or meaning at sentence level. So yes, you will have to read a lot of the text, if not all the text. Um, you'll have to be able to pick out main ideas, but also um, specific details. In terms of strategies, um, well, we've got to read the questions carefully. We're going to do a lot of work on that today. Um, underlining words in sentences, um, nouns and verbs, for example, not to forget adjectives. Uh, we want to bring any knowledge that we have into this exam um, because by bringing our knowledge and just trying to predict, rule in or rule out using common sense, th that relates to engagement. So the more you engage with the question and the answer choices, then I think it's going to stick in your mind as you go through the text. So engagement is important. Um, we'll read that text. As we read, we want to rule out the incorrect answers um, and then select the correct answer. And remember for selecting the correct answer, there are two strategies in that sense. One is simply that ruling out. Sometimes it's easier to rule out the wrong answers than it is to select the right answer. Other times it's easier to rule in than rule out. So it will be question by question, everyone. Okay, we're going to use the QAT method. Now, those people who attended the Part C um, session, reading part C session, or watch the video, you might remember we did something called QTA. QTA is question, question stem, text, then read the answers. But for part B, I think it's worth trying a different strategy. I think it's worth going for QAT. Read the question, look at your three answer choices, then go to your text, and, and once you get to your text, you're going to have a choice. You may read that whole text or you may read sections of the text 
and rule out answers as you go. Now, they're both acceptable methods um, and it will depend on what you're reading, how you're going with your time management and how quickly you understand. Okay, so here's our first one, everyone. Now let's have a look at this text, everyone. I'm only showing you the questions first. So we're going to look at the questions first. And this is where I want you to get involved and um, type in any thoughts that you have as we go through this. So it says here, doctors are advised to break confidentiality if. Okay, that's our question stem. So we got the word if and break, doctors are advised to break confidentiality. Okay, so in other words, we could rephrase that. In what situation should doctors break confidentiality? When is it necessary to break confidentiality? That's what we're looking for. And we've got different, because it's an if, these are different situations. So doctors should break confidentiality if Failure to do so, so means break confidentiality. Failure to do so would put other people in danger. Makes sense. They are advised to break confidentiality if they inform the patient of their intention in advance. Let the patient know that you're going to do that. That sounds like respectful. Uh, and C, they are advised to break confidentiality if the patient refuses to disclose information relevant to their care. So they're refusing to disclose or to release. Okay, so we know our questions. Now we've got to come up with an answer. So here we go, everyone. So I've broken this down into sections. So everybody read this. And we'll see if the answer, this isn't the whole text. This is only part of the text. Anil, well done, Anil. Anil's made a prediction. Predictions are good. You're welcome to predict everyone if you have a feeling. Because that means engagement, everyone. So feel free to type in your predicted answer now. Um, okay, let's read this first bit. Confidentiality is central to trust between doctors and patients. Without assurances about confidentiality, patients may be reluctant to seek medical attention or to give doctors the information they need in order to provide good care. All right, is there anything there? We've mentioned confidentiality. Is there anything mentioned about breaking confidentiality? Can you see anything about that, everyone? anything about breaking the confidentiality a few people know i'm getting a few answers there no so, so therefore it's not in this section right so let's continue let's go to the second section all right let's see what we got here we got the word however now however is always a clue however is a clue because it's contrast, right? So always be aware of this word. So that means the answer is going to be in the second section. Okay, we'll read it together. And then I want you, I want you to um, tell me which answers are wrong. People are predicting A's, probably the most popular, but also we have some predictions of C's. Okay, let's have a look. However, Faced with a situation in which a patient's refusal to consent to disclose leaves other, others exposed to a risk so serious that it outweighs the patient's and the public's interest in maintaining confidentiality. So we're talking about risk here. Faced with a situation in which a patient's refusal, they're not um, consent, refusal so if a patient's refusal to consent, well, we've got refusal down the bottom for C, right? 
but in which a patient's refusal to consent to disclosure leaves others exposed to risk. Now that also relates to A, doesn't it? So we're thinking A or C here. So serious that it outweighs the public's, the patient's and the public's interest in maintaining confidentiality. So that's one reason. Or if it is not practical or safe to seek the patient's consent, information should be disclosed promptly to an appropriate authority, which means they're breaking. If you're going to disclose it, you're breaking confidentiality. There it is. Harim says, here comes A. We're getting A or C. Last sentence, the patient should be informed in advance that the doctor will be disclosing the information, provided this is practical and safe. Even if the doctor in intends to disclose without the patient's consent. So we're getting A's and C's as the main answers. Okay, let's have a bit of a look. Well, it's not B. Um, logically incorrect, isn't it? Because break should break confidentiality if they inform the patient of their intention in advance. Well, probably the doctor shouldn't break confidentiality as a general rule. So it's not about if they inform, they should. That doesn't really make sense, this one. So we're coming back to A or C, everyone. Now, people are going for C. Doctors are advised to break confidentiality if the patient refuses to disclose information. They can break it if the patient refuses. Well, let's have a look. If faced with a situation in which patient refusal to consent, that's only half the sentence, everyone. People going for C, unfortunately, no. It does not match. Let me explain that a little bit more. It says, however, faced with a situation in which refusal leaves others exposed to a risk so serious that it outweighs the patient's and the, and the public's interest. So in other words, it's not good to keep confidential, to maintain it, right? You don't want to maintain it. You want to break it, right, in that case. So if others are exposed to a risk by keeping confidentiality, in those cases, you need to break it. Information should be disclosed. Answer A. a long sentence that's a bit tricky like that but there it is and think about the wording everyone if you went for c think about the wording of a it's a long sentence but if you failed in other words failure to do so um failure to do so failure to break if you didn't break it if you maintained confidentiality so opposite of breaking confidentiality is maintaining confidentiality. But you don't want to, you don't have to maintain confidentiality if that information puts others at risk. All right, maybe they have some sort of infectious disease. You have to let others know. Is that clear, everyone? Answer is A. Little bit tricky with that long sentence. C says a patient ref if a patient refuses to disclose information. No, it's it's not refusal to disclose information. It's consent to disclosure. So just be aware of that, everyone. The information doesn't match. A patient's refusal to consent to disclosure. So that's refusal to consent. This says refusal to disclose. This says patient's refusal to consent to agree to disclosure. It's different, isn't it? It doesn't match. It does not match. Answer A. 
Okay, let's move on everyone. We solved it. All right. So uh, when in doubt, really make sure all of those sentences match. Let's try. Now a little bit of vocabulary, everyone. Uh, we've been doing vocabulary in these series. So, and this time I wanted to look at um, um, collocation, which collocation, um, many of you will know, it's the way that words go together. Um, and some adjectives are commonly um, placed with nouns. Verbs also go with nouns. So let's find out which words go together. So I want you to type in um, which words go together. Um, we've got a, a type of responsibility, a type of handover, a type of plan, a type of care, types of circumstances. And then we've got a different word here, participate. participate. So let's see which words go with which. If you know any, type them in now. What type of responsibility do we have? Responsible, uh, yes, responsible is the adjective, yes, but I'm gonna take a word from the top. I'll do the first one, everyone. A shared responsibility in this case, shared. That means two people have the responsibility. Yes, we could have said individual responsibility, Reju, exactly right. Um, a type of handover. What sort of handovers do you have in your workplace? An individual, well, that's handing over a patient, I suppose. Um, in this case, we're gonna say a structured handover where you have a plan in place. It's structured, it's organized. Plan, what type of plans do we have? Jamfell writes written. Yes, a written plan. A written, um, yes, and we can have a written handover. That's right, Maketa and Jovita. So these have a few different um, options here. What type of care? Critical care, ICU. Circumstances. Uh, well, when we're referring to the patient's circumstances, Sergio's got it, individual circumstances. And then last one, we can actively participate in something. So um, now which one is the odd one out? Well, we, one of these uh, has a different pattern. We've got adjective noun, but the last one doesn't fit, does it? It's actively is an adverb plus participate is a verb. So the others are adjectives and nouns. Now I'm showing you this Pay attention when you're reading. Collocation is king. You need to know which words go together. This will help your understanding and help you read more quickly and also help you write better. Okay, let's have a look at our task, everyone. Now, according to the guidance notes, all staff. Now, we're going to look for keywords here, everyone. You can help me out. It says all staff, all staff involved in transferring patients from critical to general care must. Okay, so if we rephrase this, what must they do, everyone? All staff involved in transferring patients from critical to general care, they must do something. What is it? They must obtain necessary consent, there's that word consent again, agreement from any interest, interested party. So anyone interested, we've got to get consent. B, they must ensure that the patient, patient's personal care plan is also transferred. Okay, so two things. They've got to transfer the patient and the care plan, personal care plan. 
C, they must make arrangements for ongoing cooperation once the transfer is complete. All right, so we've got three options there. Does anyone have a prediction what it might be? And also just think about the way I'm reading this to you, everyone. I'm, I'm, these ABC, they're all completing sentences. So I'm, I'm saying must obtain, must ensure, must make arrangements, all right? All staff involved in transferring. There's something they must do when we go from critical to general. Getting some different predictions here, Bs and Cs, uh, mainly Bs and Cs. Okay, good. All right, let's now look at our text. So we're going to do it in sections, everyone. Okay, so we've got the first section here. The critical care area transferring team, the critical care area transferring team and the receiving ward team, there's two teams, should take shared responsibility for the care of patients being transferred. They should take shared responsibility. They should jointly, same meaning, isn't it? Jointly, together, ensure that. Well, now this, look, watch your language here. When you see the word ensure, it relates to must, doesn't it? And it's mentioned in B as well. Um, okay, that's important. They must ensure there's continuity of care through a formal structured handover from critical care area staff to ward staff, including both medical and nursing staff, supported by a written plan. Okay, so it's a structured handover supported by a written plan. The receiving ward with support from critical pair care, if required, then deliver that plan. Okay, that they've agreed on, right? Okay, that's the first part. All right, make your predictions. I'll bring the next section up. We need to read more here. When 1.16, when patients are transferred to the general ward from a critical care area, they should be offered information about their condition and encouraged to actively participate in decisions that relate to their recovery. Now, this is about patients, but we're not really talking about the patients. Um, they should be offered, but this is talking about all staff. I think the answer comes in 1.15. A lot of people going for B. Uh, a few C options happening. B seems to be the most popular. All right, let's have a look. Well, it's not A. All right. And it's not C. So that means the answer is B. Well done if you got that. Good predictive skills, everyone. That is awesome. Now, a couple of people, I just want to talk about C. C is a bit of a trap, and a couple of people also went for C. Now, we've got to be careful about C. It's a bit tempting. Make arrangements for ongoing cooperation once the transfer is complete, right? Well, what does it say when we look at the text, everyone? We need continuity of care through a formal handover, supported by a written plan, and the receiving ward with support from critical care, if required, can deliver the agreed plan. So I think the handover and the notes go together. The problem with C is make arrangements for ongoing care once the transfer is complete. So what does once here mean? Once means after. Make arrangements after the transfer is complete. No, not after. Not after. 
has to be done at the same time. You don't make arrangements for cooperation after you hand over. You make those arrangements beforehand. Everything has to be agreed. All good? All good? All right, let's move on, everyone. Let's keep going. Type in any questions if you have any as we go. Let's look at the next one. Okay, this time we're going to do a bit. Um, I'm going to go through this um, vocabulary and have a look at this. And we've got an adjective, a qualifier, and a head noun. So this is relating to attributive nouns. So we often have two nouns grouped together. The one that qualifies or gives extra information about the head noun, the main noun. Now our qualifying nouns won't take a plural form in most cases. And um, they're giving extra information about the main noun. Now, before I bring these up, I'm going to talk, listen to Dina's comment. Dina says, it's from experience in real life to predict situation, situation B. Patients file often forgotten. Ah, well spotted, Dean. So sometimes the file's forgotten. So that's that joint and shared responsibility. When you have experience, use it. Okay. So we've got different types of screening, everyone. We've got nutrition screening, nutrition assessment, nutrition support. We've got a hospital stay. And we've also got a screening tool. When we talk about screening, what are we doing here? If we're screening a patient, how do you screen a patient, everyone? I'll let you answer that as health professionals. All right, let's continue. So again, let's look at our questions. The memo says, the memo says, whoop, let's go back one. Failure to screen a patient. So this is our topic, everyone. Failure to screen a patient. Machina says assessing for screening, yeah. Assessment according to criteria. Well expressed, Pierre. Assessment according to a set of criteria. That's how you screen. Maybe parameters that they need to be within. That's screening. Okay. Failure to screen a patient for malnutrition may result in so if you don't screen the patient so this one says failure to screen therefore if you don't screen a patient something might happen what is it a a change in overall health a prolonged stay in the care facility or care providers being unaware of an issue they don't know okay you're welcome to make your predictions. I'll bring up the text. Okay, so again, we're doing this in two parts. This is to remind staff of the importance of nutrition screening to identify problems which may go unrecognized and therefore remain untreated during the patient's hospital stay. Nutrition screening should occur on admission and then weekly during the patient's episode of care. So regular screening, at least monthly in slower stream facilities or if the patient's clinical condition changes. Okay. 
Can we rule out or rule in any answers at this stage? This is to remind staff of the importance of nutrition screening to identify problems which may go unrecognized and therefore remain untreated. Let's keep going. Not gonna give away too many clues here. Getting lots of A's and B's here. Um, all patients should have their weight and height documented on admission and weight should continue to be recorded at least weekly. Okay, that's that screening. Patients whose score is at risk on a validated screening tool or whose clinical condition is such that the treating team identifies them as at risk of malnutrition should, re should be referred to a dietitian for full nutrition assessment and nutrition support. We're getting a big run on C's at the moment. Yes, people are considering. All right, let's have a look. So it's not A, everyone. Um, because it says failure to screen a patient for malnutrition may result in a change of overall health. No, it's the opposite. If there is a change, do the screening. So do screening if the patient's condition changes. No, the screening doesn't result in a change of overall health. If there's a, it's a reverse. If there is a change in health, then do the screening. So it's the reverse. Some people went for B earlier on, and which was a good prediction, but actually may result in a prolonged stay at the care facility. Well, does it say anywhere there that there it's causing a prolonged, may result in a prolonged stay? It doesn't mention that. It says how often things should be done, but it doesn't talk about the length of stay. It just says do things on a regular basis. The answer, everyone, is C. And what's the key word, everyone? What's the key word for me? And tell me if you found it. Unrecognized. This is to remind staff of the importance of nutrition screening to identify problems which may go unrecognized. So therefore, if you don't screen, care providers may be unaware. So it's important to screen for problems which may go unidentified and therefore remain untreated. Unrecognized relates to being unaware. So if you don't screen for malnutrition, there may be a problem. So that's nutrition screening. All right, is that clear, everyone? Does that make sense? That's why we do it. Failure to screen means you won't know of a potential problem. Um, and the particular problem is malnutrition. Ben's a little bit confused. Let's just have a look very hard. I think it's clear you've got to get your synonyms. We've got to read our question. The memo says failure to screen a patient for malnutrition, so may result in. So the question is saying, what will happen if you do not screen? That's what it's asking. What will happen if you do not screen? That's the question, everyone. All right. Um, got a weird text there. So what will happen if you do not screen? Well, the importance of screening, this is to remind staff of the importance of nutrition screening to identif identify problems. So this is the reason to identify why, to identify problems which may go unrecognized. 
So what will happen if you don't go, if you do not screen? Problems may go unrecognized. There's your answer. You're trying to identify. All right, what will happen if you do not screen? Problems may go unrecognized. Screening will enable you to pick up on those problems before they get worse. Okay. And then you do regular screening to um, keep everything on track. Um, Bin says prolonged stay. What, what makes you think it will be a prolonged stay? I mean, it could happen, but it's not given. That's not what it's saying. That's not what the failure is because you might not screen some patients, but they may not have. That doesn't mean um, they're going to have a prolonged stay if they don't have symptoms. It's simply not given. Okay. All right, let's move on. We've got more to do. Okay, we're doing vocabulary here, everyone. So um, we got liaise, that's a nice official word, liaise, an academic word, or to replenish something, or a requisition. Let's look at what these words mean, everyone. So to liaise, to work together with someone. So if you're liaising, you're in communication and you're working together, perhaps on the same patient, part of a team. Um, to replenish, sometimes supplies run out. So you replenish supplies. If you run out of medication, you need to replenish it. A requisition. What's a requisition? Well, it's a request something that you order. Yes, restore is a good one for replenish. Okay, so these are words we're going to see. These are words you may see in your workplace. Let's have a look at our text, everyone. This policy, policy document states that nurses, it's all about nurses, everyone. Let's have a look. States that nurses must sign a paper form if they want new stock. So we've got to watch out for these words. Look at this, must, that's our modal verb. They must sign a paper if they want new stock. Okay, B. Nurses can order medicines from the pharmacy in some, look at these words, everyone, in some cases. And C, should speak to the pharmacist if a drug is needed urgently. I don't think we can really predict this one easily. You're welcome to try. Um, but all of them seem like possible options that you would need to do. Okay, let's read it in sections, everyone. See if we can rule out any answers here, everyone. Try to rule out certain answers. If stock levels of a medicine are low, the nurse should first liaise directly with their ward-based team to arrange urgent stock replenishment. Okay, this is what you have to do. Be careful of your ifs, everyone. If stock levels of a medicine are low, the nurse should firstly liaise directly, so work together, liaise with their ward-based team to arrange urgent stock replenishment. That's your first plan. But then we've got another if. If the ward-based team is unavailable, the nurse should complete a request form online and email it to the pharmacy. Okay. Paper-based ordering systems are available. However, these should not be relied on if 
ward stock is urgently needed. Okay, what can we rule out here, everyone? Which answer can we rule out? We can rule out something here. Do you know what it is? Yet A must sign a paper that hasn't been mentioned yet so far. All right. Does it say anything about speaking, everyone? C uh, should speak to a pharmacist. No, I think we can rule out C at this stage because it says they, they've got to re complete a request form. Nothing about speaking. Okay, let's read a bit more. At-risk medicines, diazepam, codeine, phosphate, this one, cocodamol, or however you pronounce that, may only be ordered for stock when a paper requisition is written. Paper-based requisitions should be complete, legible, and signed. We've got the word signed and then sent to the pharmacy. So my question is, we have to make answers match. This is what you've got to do on exam day. So here's my question to you. We've got the word sign. Does A and this paragraph match or not? So always think about that, everyone. Does it match? Must sign up if they want. Now, we've got to be careful because we've got this word any does that mat does that match at risk medicine not any thank you sonia well done it doesn't match it's not talking about at risk it you've got to sign a paper for at risk medications diazepam codeine and so on but not any new stock it this is talking about something specific so we can rule that out so this is what you do on your way, everyone, not match. This is the strategy. Wards, clinical areas using Medewell 365 cabinets will have orders automatically, transmitted automatically to a pharmacy on a daily basis as stock is used. Okay, what's the answer? That's not really related to the questions. What nurses, this is an automatic thing. So where's our answer? Where's our answer, everyone? Here we go. Lots of Bs coming in. Well, it's not A. And it's not C. Which we saw before. Answer is C. And we can work that out. It's not too bad, is it? They can order medicine from the pharmacy in some cases. What, which case? If the ward team is unavailable. So normally they go through their ward-based team. That's the standard. But if the ward team is unavailable, they do an online request form with the pharmacy. Crystal clear? It's not too bad. We can work that one out. All right, a lot of people went for B. Well done, everyone. All right, good job. See, Part B is not too bad, a lot of these questions, if you take the time to work it out. Can we say the answer after however? Yes, but I'm looking for however here. Um, well, however, yes, you can, but not always not always can we say that? however these should not be relied on paper-based ordering systems are available but these should not be relied on so that's saying don't do paper-based paper-based is not good so that's ruling out that section glad that worked for you bin all right let's continue Okay, we're going to do a bit of vocabulary. We'll go through, I'll 
do this first. Um, so we've got some adjectives and nouns this time. So you start to see a little bit of repetition with some of the words like circumstances. So we've got decisions, circumstances, care, deterioration, another care. Let's have a look. You're welcome, healing. Okay, so we have exceptional circumstances. That goes together. Exceptional. We have rapid deterioration. Very fast. Collaborative care. Patient-centered care. And final decisions. The last decision that we make. So these words go together. We'll see these words in our text, everyone. Let's have a look. Okay, looking at our questions, everyone. The extract from the guidelines. So it's, this is a guideline, everyone, states. What does it state? ICU staff can be seconded. There's a difficult word, seconded. ICU staff can be seconded to other words. What does second mean? It means they go and work in a different ward for a period of time. They're seconded. Uh, states that, the guidelines state that only a consultant, no one else, only a consultant can refer a patient to ICU. C, the ICU is fully responsible for a patient in their care. So it's all about the ICU, everyone. All about the ICU. Let's bring up some text. You can make your predictions. Let's read. So this has little brief documents. So this is 6.2.1, the finer detail on the documentation, everyone. Let's see what we can work out. I want you to tell me what you can rule out. Unplanned admissions to the ICU need a referral at consultant level. Ah, only a consultant can refer a patient to the ICU. Then in exceptional circumstances, referrals will be discussed with the ward registrar looking after the patient if a delay in referral to ICU would lead to rapid deterioration. Aha, Anil's got it. We're going to rule out B. We're going to rule out B, aren't we? Because the first sentence says we need a consultant referral, but then we get our contrast, everyone, don't we? Here's our contact, contract. This rules out. We think it's B, but then we rule it out because in exceptional circumstances, there's another method. We can discuss it with the ward register because the patient may have rapid deterioration. Now, Sagitha says the screen is not clear. I hope it's clear for everyone. Could be internet, um, but hopefully that clears up for you. Okay, next one. All patients discussed with the ICU staff but not admitted, remain under the care of the primary team. And as such, they should remain responsible for reviewing and escalating care should deterioration occur. So all patients discussed with ICU staff, but not admitted, okay, they're not admitted, remain under the care of the primary team, the first team, the first unit. So we're not ICU yet. All right, keep going. Have a read of this, everyone. We encourage collaborative patient-centered care. Everyone works together. However, the ICU is defined as a closed unit. This means that when patients are admitted into ICU, they are under the care of the ICU team. It is expected that members of the primary referring team will liaise daily, that word liaise, liaise daily with the ICU team to discuss the patient's management. However, key word, everyone, however, 
read to the end. It is up to the ICU team to make final decisions. What do you think, everyone? A, B, or C? A lot of people going for C. It's not A, not given. Don't, they don't say that. Uh, we already ruled out B. We knew that. Answer is C. All right, everyone is doing fantastic. The ICU is fully responsible for a patient in their care. C, yep, ICU team to make final decisions. That's right, Christine. All right. So we can work these out. You've just got to do it quickly and with focus. Okay, we've got one more, everyone. We've got one more. Wash hands, says Bin. Yes. Um, the other department wash their hands. The so ICU is looking after the patient. All right, let's keep going. Oh. Okay, I think we're done there, everyone. That's it. All right, now we'll stop there. That's, um, that's what we've got done on our slides today, everyone. Um, there is one more B5, there's B6 there, everyone. Now B6 is on the OET Center website. So go and do B6 yourself. Um, any questions, everyone? We've got one or two minutes left. Any questions, just shoot them through now. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about OET online if you are looking for um, a, an organized and structured course. Um, what makes study with OET online um, a good choice? Well, I'd say it's a team effort, everyone. Um, what do we do? We try to offer excellence in e-learning. And as um, Annual said, what about OET Home? Yeah, breaking news, everyone. We have OET Home coming up. That is wonderful. You'll be able to, if you choose, take the exam at home. Now, keep your eye on that with the OET Center. They're the ones that are going to keep you up to date. Any questions about that, ask Rebecca when you see her. Um, all right. Bin says we need daily reading part B. Just come and join our website, uh, Christine um, or Bin, and you'll be able to access all of that information. Uh, Saju says, can we have more class on reading part C? Well, we just did reading part C, Saju. But again, if you can join our online courses, we have regular live classes for our paid courses and great value, I might add. So check that out, Saju. Um, what about June, June 13 exams? Check the OET Centre website, check the local government situations, keep your fingers crossed. Saha asked reading part A, coming very soon, Saha. In about four weeks time, we'll get on to that. Next week is listening part B. Kurosh says, when's the next session? In two weeks, everyone. We'll be back on in two weeks time. Same time on a Wednesday, listening part, um, listening part B. Ajit says, where will we search for OET website? So I will change the slide. Thank you. You're welcome, Lindsay. I'm glad you liked the class and also Dina for the vocabulary. 
Yasser wants to know the price of the writing course only and how many letters will be corrected. I'll mention that in a moment as we wrap up. Okay. Speaking, what we'll do in the future, Safalata. All right, you're welcome, healing. Yeah, so just remember what we do. We, we try to have the, the excellence in e-learning. We offer the highest quality material that we make ourselves. We've got an excellent team of dedicated and passionate teachers. And that combined with um, student support. Now, that's a real thing, important thing for us. We're always in touch with our students. So if you've got difficulties, um, our team's going to help you, our student um, service department. Plus you, you are the highly motivated students. It's that combination that brings ex exam success. So stay motivated. And, um, and uh, a couple of people are saying they're worried about, I'll just show the last thing, everyone, as we wrap this up. So here's our website, everyone. Someone asked about our writing courses. They're up here, everyone. You can see them on this page. Um, great value, lots of correction, eight corrections in the virtual writing class plus online grammar review. That's a really good one. Um, virtual writing class has five correction. So we've really increased our numbers of correction and great value. So that's going to work for you, everyone. Check it out. And um, I'll also tell everyone, um, I'll give you all a good link, everyone. You want to find out what we're all about? Just join our free trial course, everyone. It's got free practice material. So if you want a bit of extra part B, extra part A, just come and check out our free trial course. No obligation. Just come along. You want to do a trial class to see what it's like? You can register for that through our free trial course. So that's where you can check it all out. Um, thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks. Um, Anil says, I'm worried about online. So is Lindsay worried about typing? Well, paper base will remain available. It will remain available. Okay. All right. Good luck, everyone. Keep in touch and we'll see you in the next session. Bye for now.